want to welcome Micah Redding uh, to the stage. I've known Micah for, gosh, going on a decade now, I feel like. He is the, uh, the president and founder of the Christian Transhumanist Association. He's a, a writer and a software developer right here in Nashville. And when I knew him, he was a rock star, <laughs> literally, as a, a part of the trio, the Redding Brothers, who have played all over the country and all over the world, including in war zones in Afghanistan and to hear Square during the revolution. Micah is a Mensa. He's one of the smartest guys I know and also one of the nicest. Let's join me in welcoming Micah Redding. Uh, thank you. I'll see him. All right. Uh, so I have uh, been like, super keyed up um, working on this conference for a long time. So I'll probably speak about twice the normal human speed. I'm going to try to slow that down and make it comprehensible. That's an almost impossible task, but we'll try. So I want to talk about what Christian transhumanism is and why I think it's significant, why it's important. Uh, and to do that, uh, we first need to talk a little bit about what transhumanism is, why it's significant, and why we might want to talk about it so much that we all came here today. Um, so this is something that a lot of people have asked me over the last several weeks. What is transhumanism? And there's a lot of definitions, a lot of ways we could talk about this, but the simplest definition is that transhumanism is a movement to use science and technology to transform what it means to be human. So that should invite all kinds of questions, right? So what does it mean to be human? What has it meant to be human? What should it mean to be human? And as we kind of grow and develop as uh, individuals and communities and a species, what do we want it to mean to be human? And so those are huge questions. And um, you may not realize it, but if you think about it a minute, those are the questions that are really at the heart of what faith tries to address. These are the questions that over the millennia faith has spoken to. All right, and so um, it's um, it's astounding to me that in these conversations about uh, our transhumanist future, that um, more people of faith aren't involved. Right? Aren't these exactly the sorts of questions we should be answering? We should be addressing. We should be engaged in. And so that's the first thing that Christian transhumanism is. It's um, a conversation between the leading edges of scientific and technological thought and the broad world of people of faith. And I tell a lot of people, we're, we're in the business of cultivating awkward conversations because these are the things that it doesn't seem like people want to talk about. Right? Or it doesn't seem like these people want to be in conversation with each other. And so we're trying to, to bring, those for, uh, bring those together um, uh, to engage and interact and so forth. And it's, it's difficult because um, many of the people who are uh, leading the efforts, who are putting the most energy and enthusiasm into some of these transhumanist projects such as getting us off planet, um, maybe eradicating disease around the world, extending our lifespans, or modifying our, our genetics to upgrade our bodies, make us stronger, faster, or smarter, maybe integrate our brains with computers. Um, m most of those people, or a large number of them, come from a kind of narrow, small group that isn't very conversant with the kind of broad world of faith. And correspondingly, most of the world of people of faith has no window into these conversations. And I think that's a recipe for a bad future, right? If we have the people who are pushing the future of humanity forward, not being able to communicate effectively with the majority human experience across space and time, 
which is an experience uh, that is encapsulated in many of our religious traditions and our faith traditions, I think that's not a recipe for a future we want. And so we need to bring these people together to engage in these conversations. And importantly, um, I think we need to engage in those conversations from a constructive, positive standpoint. Meaning, we don't need to just enter into these conversations and say, well, we're the Christians, we've showed up, and now you've got to listen to what we have to say. Right? I think we're long past the point where Christians can just kind of drop in at the last minute and hand down a set of moral pronouncements and expect people to take it on that authority. Because at that point, the conversation is already over. So um, the thing about a conversation is, is that um, one of the reasons I think maybe it's, uh, these are awkward conversations, conversations that people don't want to have, is because a conversation is a challenging thing. If you are in a conversation, you might come to challenge the other person, but you have to be willing to be challenged yourself, or you're not in a conversation, right? And that's hard work. It takes us to be being humble, le- being willing to learn, being willing to be wrong, things like that. And, um, and so that process, if we want to engage in that conversation as people of faith, we need to do some work to have something constructive, positive, and meaningful to offer. And um, that means that we need to develop and dig deep into our understanding of what science and technology actually are within our tradition. And so that's the second thing that Christian transhumanism is. It's an emerging theology of science and technology. And, um, you know, I I often um, think that our culture gives us two different ways to respond to new technologies. One of the ways is that it, um, we're invited to be reactionary. So we see a new technology come along, and we say, uh, that's new, it's untested, I don't like it, therefore it must be bad. Um, and I, I remember seeing this with a lot of uh, social media. When social media first started happening, and Facebook was available to people uh, Um, at large scale for the first time, I saw a lot of people say, you know, that's, uh, I don't know, that seems, that seems iffy, that's bad. And, and interestingly, um, most of those people have now joined Facebook, right? But the irony of that is that by saying, well, that's bad, I'm not going to engage, I'm just going to step aside, they lost a small window of opportunity to actually steer the direction that much of that has developed. Right? So we have to actually have a better context for that. The other thing that our culture often kind of gives us as a response is, uh, is consumerism. We see a new thing, we see a new gadget, and we say, okay, I like that, I want it, I've got to have the new Apple Watch, I've got to have the newest smartphone, I've got to have the newest micro drone, and then we... Um, then we <laughs> we take it and we treat it as a fashion item, right? That, that's what we're doing. We're saying, okay, this is a fad. I want to be kind of ahead of the curve or whatever. Um, and I think these are insufficiently Christian responses to technology. Um, and so we have to have a better understanding of what it is that technology actually is. What, what is this thing that we see in the world? Um, and so for me, it all starts... Um, like everything, with Genesis 1. And in Genesis 1, we see a God who creates and cultivates life, who names and categorizes creation, who sees the creative potential of the world, calls it forth, and then names it and blesses it. And then that God turns and says, I'm going to create a being like myself, who also creates and cultivates life who also names and categorizes creation, who sees the potential of the created order, evokes it, calls it forth, and then blesses it. And whether we realize it or not, those are science and technology in their most embryonic forms. That's what science and technology are. And in the biblical account, they are right at the core of what it means to be human made in the image of God. I, I, I like to say that if you drop an ant into a forest, uh, that it will build an anthill. 
And if you drop a human into a forest, it will construct a technological civilization, right? That's the thing that we do as humans. And so the question then is not, well, you know, where did this come from or whatever? We know where it came from. It's not something alien or separate from us. It's something that emerges from us. And so when we think of it as something that emerges from us, then we have to say, okay, well, how does this play a role, a significant part of our mission in the world, right? How do we shape this towards the good that we are called to do? How do we use this to create and cultivate life and not just kind of respond to the consumerist impulses we have at the moment? How do we use this in our Christian mission? How do we use it in our human mission? And when we see that, we see science and technology as something that we can imbue with values and meaning and mission. And that allows us to then bring those values into the conversation and articulate and advocate for them on a really strong, robust basis. And so that's um, the third thing Christian transhumanism is. It's a voice for positive relational values within the transhumanist project. So in the, in the last several years of our short existence, we were founded uh, in 2014, and uh, the Christian, Transhumanism, uh, Christian Transhumanist Association has um, taken a stand multiple times for these sorts of values. Um, and we've taken that stand within the context of the secular transhumanist discourse, not just as people who are showing up and saying, here's the pronouncement, but as people who are entering into that conversation and saying, this is a reason for valuing the things we value, not just because we value them, but because they're actually essential to any kind of thriving, flourishing future. And having done that, we have been well-received by the broader transhumanist, the secular transhumanist community. Because we're not showing up and just saying, well, we've got the rule book, time for you guys to listen to us. We're saying if we all want to move forward into a thriving, flourishing future, these are the only values that will actually work. So I said that a, a conversation is a challenge. Right? We, can, we can come into it offering a critique or a challenge of other people, but we also have to allow ourselves to be challenged and critiqued. And so this is the fourth thing that Christian transhumanism is. Um, it's a call to really think about what we say we believe, what story we actually tell, and ask ourselves, are we actually living up to this audacious vision? Are we actually advocating the full um, extent of what it actually says and what it actually calls us to? Or have we kind of lost our own story somewhere along the way? And um, in many parts of Christianity, I think um, people have embraced a sort of escapism. An escapism that says, we're not really doing anything here. We're just here to kind of bide our time for the next important thing to happen, which doesn't have anything to really do with us, right? It's not a challenge to us because we're not on any real thing. We're just uh, trying to punch our tickets and make sure we're on the uh, rocket ship out of here when it comes along, right? And I think that's actually so opposite of the vision I read in the New Testament and throughout the, the Scriptures, right? Um, uh, Christ calls us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then to love our neighbors as ourselves, right? And that demands that we reconcile and bring coherence to our physicality and our mentality and our spirituality. We can't allow those things to just be kind of on their own trajectories. They all have to come together to move towards a singular vision. And so Christ doesn't say, you know, time for the, time for the escape train. Um, he says, uh, he teaches his disciples to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when we look at um, the overall 
trajectory of the biblical story, I think this is what we see from beginning to end. We see in Genesis, humanity called to go out into all the world and cultivate its life. We see in the call of Abraham, Abraham is called to found a unique people and a unique tribe based on a unique idea that they would be the people and the tribe that would bless all other peoples and all other tribes. Paul in the New Testament calls that the gospel. Right? And when we move forward from Genesis to Abraham to Christ, we see that vision keep expanding. And Christ, it's right at the heart of everything he says. Um, he says, be a child of your Father in heaven who tries to bless everyone, who sends his reign on the just and the unjust. This is why you should love your enemies, because you are trying to be like a God who seeks to bless all creation. And this is, carries forward to the end of Revelation where we see the new Jerusalem descending from heaven to earth um, and then pouring life out into all creation, opening its gates and the goodness of God flows into all reality. Um, and that we see this vision as this kind of unity of the organic and the human and the technological. We see it blessing all of creation. We see it also inviting in the, the creations of all creation, right? It's all included. Um, it's part of the vision of where Christianity is going and what we are doing in the world. And so to me, this kind of carries forward to one of the most profound um, visions in the scriptures, which is Romans 8, where Paul says, all creation, the entire cosmos, waits for the children of God to be revealed, in hopes that creation itself will join in the freedom and the glory of the children of God. And so Paul's vision is not just that we bless the person next to us and the person beyond that and then all other tribes of humanity. It's that we actually bless the entire created order, that this is what humanity was originally intended to do, to go into all creation and to cultivate it and call forth its creative potential. And so I think we need, as Christians, to kind of take that challenge seriously and actually work to rethink where, how we are in relation to this story and to see if we can actually articulate a positive religion, religious vision that calls us to serve on behalf of the world. Um, so that's what Christian transhumanism is to me. It's a conversation that calls us, that challenges us to develop a deeper theology of technology, that then allows us to enter into these discussions about where technology is going, what it means, to advocate for positive relational values for our human future, and to accept a challenge to actually dig deeper into our faith and think at a deeper level about what we are doing in the world, what God wants us to do, and how science and technology and the physical world, our emotionality, spirituality, physicality, mentality, all are called to work together to bring about the vision and the work and the mission of God. So, uh, if we have any time... I'll take questions. <laughs> Do we have any time? Do we, do we have any questions? Um, okay, do we, Gabe, do we have a mic for them or? I'm loud. Uh, <laughs> here, hold on a second. Check, check. Turn it on. Here. Yeah, thank you, Micah. The, the question I have is on your comment about blessing the, in thinking about what Christians can bring to the transhumanist conversation, and your comment about uh, this um, biblical vision of blessing the entire created order, not just humans. And I, I wonder, yeah. the, my question comes a little bit out of my ignorance. I'm new to the transhumanist conversation, and so those who are, um, the, the many who are engaging in transhumanist conversation who are not Christians and don't share our dispositions or, or yeah. convictions, um, are, do they tend to, in your awareness or experience with them, uh, do they tend to be rather anthropocentric, that the future that they envision is entirely focused on human species or post-human species and what humans become? Do they really seem to care right. about our planet and any others that we may uh, you know, destroy like we're doing our own, um, so yeah. on and so forth? 
Yeah, so uh, there are different strands of, of transhumanism um, across the board, right? Secular transhumanists of all kinds. And, um, and I, I think uh, Ted mentioned that earlier, but, um, or mentioned that that's what people like me like to say. Um, and uh, so, but this is true. Like there, um, so I think a, a lot of, of secular transhumanists are anthropocentric. Right, like, and and there are some um, that, and I kind of alluded to it in some of the challenges that we've issued. Um, some are egocentric, like radically egocentric. They believe that it's it's just about them and amassing power and so forth, right? And so I think that's not the majority, but it's a significant enough minority to kind of shape where these conversations go. So you have radical egocentrism, anthropocentrism, um, but you also have um, secular transhumanists who are really um, driven by a vision of, uh, of compassion for the rest of the cosmos. Um, and so David Pierce, who I interviewed recently on, uh, on my podcast, um, he, uh, his vision is not so much what we might think of as, um, as enhancement per se. He believes that we should work to eradicate the, the suffering of the entire biological um, ecosystem, right? Which is the most audacious uh, effort I have ever heard of. I'm not, like I can't even imagine that, right? But he believes that w through bioengineering and so forth that we could actually um, literally have lambs and lions laying down together. And he believes that's what we should do. That's our ethical duty because our ethical duty should be to reduce suffering to an extreme degree. So that's one kind of ethical vision that exists in secular transhumanism, um, among others, right? Um, and so, yeah, I, I, we get an entire variety of it, but, but it's, it's almost like we've expanded the extremes, right? The extreme egocentrists, the extreme anthropocentrists, and then the extreme whatever that is, right? Like that, that cares about everything in a way that you know, we could call that radical veganism, right? It's, it's, um, it's, it, it's, so, it's so intense, right? Um, it's as if we just did take those scriptural passages literally, and it's, it's almost unimaginable from a Christian context, and it shows up in a transhumanist context. Um. You discussed the need to bring a Christian theological worldview into the larger transhumanist conversation, which I think is wonderful. Um, I'm wondering if you can think of or point to any specific examples mm. where a Christian reading of a transhumanist future might diverge from more popular secular transhumanist visions. Okay, a Christian reading of a secular transhumanist future. So, uh, thinking about why a Christian theological worldview is necessary. Oh, sure. Um, so what would be an example where that helps us imagine a mm. different future yeah. than what transhumanists are already imagining? Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, so I would say that it's very rare in, um, in secular transhumanism to think of love and compassion and cooperation as central to our future, right? That's not m the majority radar, right? Um, because the idea is that we can just solve this, you know, we can just solve this through kind of a, a, a crude application of external things, right? That we don't actually have to think too much about the values that we're bringing into it and that something like love is kind of a, a, a peripheral thing, right? It's nice because we're humans, we like it but it's not really what enables our future, right? And I think from a Christian perspective, um, I would want to say love is actually essential to any kind of life. There is no life without love. Um, that's a Christian doctrine that is almost entirely absent from most kinds of discussions, right? And so the idea of, um, of our role in, in the universe to be of, of blessing, right, that framing too, changes it, right? Um, we can talk about why we might want to bring life to planets and so forth, but from the Christian perspective, we could say, well, maybe life is what God intends for creation. Maybe that's something we can participate in, um, not just because we happen to like it, but because it's something that actually God calls us to do. These are big, big questions, um, 
And uh, I'm, I'm out of time. Uh, what, what do we got back here? Yeah. Mm. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Anything from Christianity that we would not want to bring into a transhumanist future. Okay, so, so that's interesting, and it, it's a huge discussion. So tribalism is an interesting thing. Like the, the, um, we can think about that. That's a common characteristic of, of religions. Um, and Christianity in the biblical story doesn't say, well, we're not tribes anymore. It says, we are tribes called to bless all the other tribes. Our defining characteristic is that we bless that which is other than ourselves. Um, so I think there are definitely interpretations of Christianity that we would not want to bring into a transhumanist future, just as there are interpretations or versions of transhumanism that none of us would actually be interested in. Um, I've, that's all my time. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>